Hi, welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight, we will be featuring a case from my hometown, Boston, Massachusetts. The case, Charles Stewart. If you're from here, you know the name, you know the bridge. But if you're not from here, the name you probably don't know. So let's find out more. Let's go ahead and dive on in. Charles Stewart. He was born December 18th, 1959. By all accounts, Charles was described as ruggedly handsome and athletic. Charles went to Salem State College, but ended up dropping out after only two months. He later got a job on Newberry Street in Boston at a prominent furrier he even rose to the general manager position. Now, let's introduce Carol DeMotti. She was born March 26th, 1959. She graduated from Boston College, BC in 1981, and then went on to Suffolk University Law School and graduated in 1986. She ended up getting a job as a tax lawyer. Well, Chris and Charles met in 1980 when they were both working at the Driftwood Restaurant in Revere, Massachusetts. At this place, he was a chef and she was a waitress. Well, they started dating and then later got married in 1985. Well, how did others describe Carol? She was described as outgoing and, quote, talked about her problems pretty freely, while Charles was described as quiet, and reserved, kind of introverted, end quote. Things appear to be going well with Charles and Carol. Young couple, they got married, and they bought their home. They bought a house in Reading, Massachusetts. And to top it off, Carol became pregnant. The couple was going to have their very first child, and she was due in December 1989. Well, October 23rd, 1989. Charles and Carol had just finished attending childbirth classes at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, right in the city. This is what Charles stated happened after that. They were driving home from childbirth class and they got to a red light, a stoplight. Out of nowhere, a black gunman with a raspy voice forced his way into the couple's vehicle, and he ordered them to drive to Mission Hill. This man then robbed them and then opened fire. Charles was shot in the stomach and Carol was shot in the head. Charles, however, was able to escape and drove away. He then called 911 on his car phone a film crew for CBS reality TV series, Rescue 911, they just happened to be riding with the Boston Emergency Medical Services that night. So when the call came in for an ambulance, they were already with the ambulance to capture everything that unfolded. So they were able to capture the scene as the police and paramedics assisted Charles. Carol, who was just 30 years old that night, sadly passed away. But before passing away, she delivered her son, Christopher, via C-section. Well, Christopher suffered seizures due to oxygen deprivation. And 17 days later, his father, Charles, discontinued his life support. Christopher passed away. At Carol's funeral, Charles composed a speech. In that speech, he was, unable, was not able to deliver, but it was read by a good friend. It stated, quote, good night, sweet wife, my love. God has called you to his side, end quote. In referring to the killer, the speech continued, quote, in our souls, we must forgive the sinner because he would too, end quote. The police 
immediately pursued black men without probable cause. This caused an uproar and big time racial tension in Boston. And this got everything tense to an all time high. Well, December 28th, 1989, so two months later, the police found who they considered to be a suspect. His name was Willie Bennett. Charles even came in and identified Willie out of a police lineup. This is the man who shot him and killed and shot his wife. Well, this must be where the story ends, right? Not even close. The police case against Willie Bennett quickly ended. Well, how is that? Charles just identified him. Well, Charles's brother, Matthew, came forward to police and he stated Charles was the one who killed his wife, Carol, and then shot himself to make it look like a robbery gone bad. Matthew admitted to police that he had driven to meet Charles that night to help him commit what he'd been told was going to be an insurance fraud. Upon arrival, Matthew said he had seen that Carol had been shot and that his brother, Charles, was shot and wounded as well. He had apparently shot himself to support the story he was going to give of being attacked. Matthew, deciding to help, took the gun and took the bag of valuables from Charles. This included Carol's wedding rings, and he threw them off the Pines River Bridge in Revere, Massachusetts. This was confirmed as those items were later recovered. So why exactly did Charles go to all this trouble to set this up? Why? Well, apparently Charles was having financial difficulties. Charles was upset that his wife had refused to get an abortion. And he worried that she would not go back to work, her job as a lawyer, after giving birth. And this would significantly lower the couple's income. A friend of Charles had stated that Charles had complained that he noticed something, something different about his pregnant wife, Carol, that he'd never seen before. Quote, that she had the upper hand, end quote, in their marriage. A spokesman for the John Hancock Mutual Life Insurance Company said that the company had paid out $82,000 in insurance to Charles in the month of December. Keep in mind, this was $82,000 back in 1989. That amount would be huge today. The payout was made at an unusually high speed at the request of Carol's employer. And the amount was twice her salary because her death was considered accidental. In addition, it had come out that Charles was interested in a 22-year-old woman that he worked with. Her name, Deborah Allen. What is known is they had gone out for several meals together. And before the shooting, she took him on a tour of her prep school. Oh, so young. Charles even gave her a pair of sneakers and a sweatshirt. What a romantic gift. I could not confirm in my research whether they were having a complete affair or were just kind of leaning that way. So who knows? On January 3rd, 1990, the police were searching for Charles. He had decided to check in to the Sheridan Terror Motel in Braintree, Massachusetts. He knew the police were on to him. He requested a wake up call for the following morning at 4.30 a.m. Well, January 4th, 1990, so the following morning, he drove into Boston, stopped his car at the bottom level of the Tobin Bridge. This is a new car that he had just bought two days prior, a $22,000 Nissan Maxima. He then turned on the hazard lights of the car. He left a note on the front seat that said he could not bear the charges that were made against him. He got out of his car and propped the hood of the car open. Charles then jumped from the Tobin Bridge in Chelsea, Massachusetts to his death. 
Although he left behind a kind of suicide note, he didn't really make it clear what his involvement was in Carol's death or why the death even happened in the first place. Overall, anybody who knew the couple was completely stunned. They could not comprehend everything that happened. Not only that, the community, Boston, could not understand why this happened. Neighbors of Carol and Charles remember them as a friendly couple who would go on jogs together, would tend to flowers in their front yard. Charles was even very helpful to his neighbors and would help them shovel snow in the winters. He also helped coach the local Little League baseball. Well, in Carol's memory, her family established the Carol DeMatti Stewart Foundation. This foundation provides scholarship aid to Mission Hill residents. The foundation has awarded millions to several hundred students who have applied for this scholarship. And that is the case of Charles Stewart. Thank you for sticking around for another episode of Danny After Dark. And thank you for listening to a case that is from my hometown, Boston, Massachusetts. Go ahead and like and subscribe again so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Do you have a suggestion for a case that you would like me to cover? Well, leave it down below in the comments and you may see it covered on a future episode. Until next time, remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us. <laughs>